Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome and greeting to all guests worshiping among us this day. The Council has the following announcements. The consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing at 7.30 p.m. tomorrow on January the 22nd in the church building. And our offerings today are for the work of Asian Mission. So far, the announcements, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, from where does our help come from? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us praise our God by singing from Psalm 63, stanzas 1 and 2. As we come into the presence of God this morning, he calls us to examine our lives according to his good and holy will, and he does that by means of his law. And so let us read God's law as we find it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, and after we hear the law, let us respond to it by singing from Psalm 119, stanzas 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us the underlying principle of God's law, showing us what lies at the heart of every commandment, teaching us this by way of a summary when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us now humble ourselves before God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank and praise you that we could enter into your presence and meet with you and worship you, the almighty God of heaven and earth, our great creator and king. Lord, there is no one who compares with you in glory, in might, 
in power or in wisdom. You have made the heavens and the earth and filled them with an array of life and beauty. You are the author and the giver of life. And you are also the upholder and the preserver of life. Nothing happens apart from your will. Not a day goes by when you are not there. Not a sparrow lands on the earth unknown to you. Not even a hair can fall from our heads apart from your will. And all this, O Lord, gives us comfort. Comfort in life and in death knowing that we belong to You through Jesus Christ, Your Son. Father, we confess that You have been so good to us. We daily experience in our lives Your hand of blessing in more ways, more numerous than we could count. You shower Your blessings upon us far more richly than we ever deserved. And yet, O oh Lord, our thankfulness often comes up so short. We owe you everything, and yet we give you so little in return for what you have given to us. You also set before us your good and holy law, and we so easily turn from it and go our own ways. We pray, therefore, that you will encourage us on the path of repentance, Forgive us and cleanse us of all our sins and wrongdoing and shortcomings for nothing other than for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. Grant us the gracious removal of our guilt, our shame, and our sorrow for every offense we have committed against you and rid us of the sin and the corruption and the pollution that still clings to us. O Lord, You know our thoughts and You know our desires and You know how contrary aspects of our lives are to Your will. And so we can only appeal to Your own faithfulness, to Your own promise. You have promised to forgive and You have given us the signs and seals of that promise in our baptism and in the Lord's Supper so that we may reflect upon Your grace in Christ, grace that is sufficient to cover all of our sins. So help us to know and to experience the reality of Christ's sacrifice for our sins whenever we look back upon all the ways that You evidence Your great love for us in Him. Father, we also pray now for Your blessing upon the reading and proclamation of Your Word. We thank You for the Scriptures. Every time we open them and read them, we see again and again afresh how compelling its message really is, how inescapable its obligations are, and how powerful is the great gospel of your mighty work of salvation. We thank you that you are not a God who remains silent, but you are a God who speaks. And when you speak, we pray that you will give us all listening ears and open hearts. Free us from all distractions. Help us to grow closer to you, to know you better, and to respond in accordance with your word. So grant us a blessed service together and a most edifying day of worship. We pray this of you in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us again join our hearts in song by singing from Psalm 63, stanzas 3 and 4.
I invite you now to turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture reading as it is found in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 14, the full chapter. We read this in connection with our text found in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. The separation of the sheep and the goats as spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ about the great and last judgment. In connection with that, let us read Isaiah 58. We'll read the full chapter. Here the prophet speaking on behalf of the Lord says these words to the people of Israel. Hear now God's word. Cry aloud and do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it, is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the, the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So far, a reading from Isaiah. Let us turn now to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. Here we find our text beginning at verse 31. Here Jesus Christ, our Lord, explains the final judgment, saying these words, 
When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or, and feed you? And when, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they, will, they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So far, our text. This morning, after the proclamation of God's word, we will respond by singing from hymn 56, Loving Shepherd of thy sheep, all thy lambs in safety keep. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our text this morning is the last recorded teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew. And as is often the case with anyone's final words, there is a deep and profound sense of importance and seriousness, solemnity and gravity to what our Savior says here, especially so when the topic at hand is the last judgment. Christ is giving us here a description of the antithesis, a clear-cut, black-and-white division of the whole human race at the end of the age between the righteous and the unrighteous. What we see here is that our Lord was not afraid to teach what was unpopular and even uncomfortable. He spoke the truth in order that the truth would set us free. But free in, in what way? Free not only in the sense of escaping eternal punishment, no, the, the pivotal point Christ is making here is that we are free also to live lives of piety. Live lives of piety. Now, what comes to mind when you hear the word piety? Maybe you think of, of, of praying with your eyes closed and your hands folded. Maybe piety conjures up certain kinds of spiritual times, spiritual places, Activities such as reading the Bible, going to church, worshiping, witnessing. Most Christians have in their thinking this category 
of activities and attitudes that fit with the idea of piety. But the Bible's teaching of piety concerns all of life, doing all things to God's glory, whole life piety, so that Sunday flows into Monday through Saturday. This life of piety pervades and, and affects everything we do. And this is what is supposed to characterize the people that we are at all times and all places. To put this another way, what Christ is teaching in our text this morning is that it is impossible to be truly religious, yet socially indifferent, disengaged, unconcerned about others. And so we need to hear his words, in his words, a strong warning against engaging in religious ritual without exercising our responsibility toward others. A response to the gospel as a church and as individual believers must be demonstrated, worked out, lived out in action and in activity that showcases the evidence of our faith. And so I proclaim God's word to you this morning under this theme. In the great separation, Christ will look for evidence of our faith. We'll see first the one separation, secondly the two surprises. Our text builds upon the the two preceding parables that we've heard in recent weeks, which each dealt with the matter of Christ's return. But what we have in our text is not so much a parable as much as it is a prediction, a prophecy, a description of the ultimate, final, irreversible separation that will affect every single person in the world at his return. Now at the outset of our text in verse 31, we are introduced to the Son of Man, a title, a designation that Christ frequently chose to describe himself. Of course, he could have chosen from any number of different names and titles and refer to himself in such a way, yet he chose this particular one which was associated with his humiliation, his suffering, and his death. He chooses here his lowliest title. But notice what he says. The Son of Man will come in his glory. The same person who had set aside his glory in his first coming will come back, but in, a, in glorified form. No longer would it be in a state of humiliation, but in a state of exaltation. And to demonstrate that, all the angels will come with him. The angels not only enhance his glory, but they also have a hand in gathering the elect and separating the the wheat from the chaff. What the scriptures tell us elsewhere, the angels will do. And we are told that he will come to sit on his glorious throne. He will take the position of king and ruler. All the other thrones in all the universe will will fade to nothing but dust on the scales before his glorious throne. What a picture this is. Quite something to imagine and, and visualize so far as we are able. Now before the separation takes place, there's first a a gathering together, we're told in verse 32. All the nations are gathered together. Here is a united nations which the world has, has never known. The warring nations and the warring religions are all brought together. North Korea side by side with the United States, Canada, right next to Cambodia. None of the nations and none of the peoples will escape this summons. And all nat- national distinctions 
fall by the wayside. They don't count for anything anymore. There will be no superpowers anymore. Great economies, great histories will mean nothing anymore. All peoples of all color, of all language and, and custom, all are united before the throne. No amount of military might or diplomatic skill or secret intelligence will be of any advantage anymore. And there, once all are gathered, the separation takes place. Quite the scene to imagine. It's not a separation that takes place along the lines of color or nationality or, or social class, but it happens like a, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now we don't know exactly how this will go, but we can perhaps envision in our minds a, a long line, all peoples in, in single file, being parted one, one way, one the other way. Perhaps separating husband and wife, parents from children, brother from sister, neighbor from neighbor, friend from friend, church member from church member. The text says he does this as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, that was a common scene in the ancient Near East. The shepherd would have his animals all grazing together until the time when he would collect his sheep to take them in for the winter while the goats remained outside because the sheep were more sensitive to the adverse winter conditions while the, the goats were more hardy. Well, when this shepherd king comes to this great flock of animals, what he sees are sheep and goats. He doesn't see bank accounts. He doesn't see donation records. He doesn't see tax receipts. He doesn't inspect the, the membership directories or, or certificates from churches. He doesn't check out the records of, of achievements or examine one's family pedigree or lineage or anything like that. He only looks to see whether they are sheep or goats, sensitive or hard. And by that he knows who belongs to him and who doesn't. And this separation will be flawless. There will not be one mistake made in the process. Not one goat will end up with the sheep. And not even the weakest believing sheep will wind up with the goats. The shepherd knows the sheep and the sheep know him. They know the shepherd for they have heard his voice and they have followed him. They are truly able to say the words that we sang earlier, The Lord is my shepherd. He in love defends me. I shall not want. In pastures green he tends me. Well, the text says that the sheep will be placed on his right and, and the goats on his left. It's important to note that this separation, this is a separation that cannot be reversed. It's set in stone. There's nothing that can be done once this division has been made. There's no second chances available. There's no opportunity for appeal. There's no hope of overturning the verdict. The goats can, can no longer become sheep. The time for prayer is over. The time for repentance and faith is over. The time for crying out for mercy is over. It's irreversible. Now, why is it necessary for this separation to be public? Why not simply get it done and over with without this dramatic scene? Well, the reason is because justice must be seen to be done. It cannot be left private. For this administration of justice vindicates Christ. We know the last time that, that the world saw him was at his crucifixion, hanging on the cross, 
condemned as a criminal, and this must be put right. And so it will be on Judgment Day that the judged one becomes the judge. The condemned one becomes the condemner. The one who was the victim of human injustice becomes the administrator of divine and perfect justice. So there must be a final demonstration and a settling of accounts and, and destinations of the living and the dead. And when this day comes, there is no hope of, of someone escaping or somehow slipping through the cracks. There will be no cracks to slip through. Now, this is final, ultimate, fixed forever, unchangeable. This is something that every pe preacher I know gives thought to whenever they preach. And it is necessary for all of us to give our thought to. Not only pertaining to ourselves, asking ourselves if our identity is that of the sheep or of goats. But also to think about this as it relates to our family members, our loved ones. Especially, the, especially those who are living contrary to the gospel, living as unconverted and unchanged by the gospel of grace. Well, certainly, there is much here in this text that makes us, can make us fearful and overcome with guilt at our failures, at our shortcomings. But as you've heard me say many times before, fear and guilt are not good motivators. Grace is a much better motivator. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we are not saved by works. This passage is not teaching that we are saved by works, but by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. And we can see that here in the case with the sheep. They are saved, says verse 34, from the foundation of the world, pointing to the fact that God elected them before they were born, before they had ever done anything, let alone put their faith in Him. But their faith has evidence to go with it. And that brings us to our second point, seeing the two surprises in our text. What does Christ reveal in our text as the standard or the criteria for his judgment? What does he look for to tell the sheep apart from the goats? Well, he tells us in verses 35 and 36, there in, in speaking to the sheep, he mentions six things that they did. This included supplying the hungry with food, supplying the thirsty with drink, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and attending to those in prison. We understand there that Christ is speaking in terms of basic care and compassion and hospitality, such as we would all extend to members of our own family. Whether one was famished or lonely, or sick, or imprisoned, the only way they would be cared for was if their family and their friends took care of them. And so the distinguishing feature of the sheep was that they demonstrated such love and care for those whom Christ describes in verse 40 as the least of these my brothers. You see, he's speaking there of the love that Christians have for one another. That's the evidence, and that's the proof that one loves Christ. The evidence, he comes to search out to see if we love one another. This, this is precisely what the Apostle John says in 1 John 3 and 4. In a variety of places, we know that we have passed out of death into life because... How we love the brothers. But if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, 
He is a liar. For he does not he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. But to those who displayed such love to the sheep in our text, to the righteous, Christ speaks these wonderful words in verse 34. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But there is this interesting twist here. I'm sure we all saw it. It's the fact that the the shepherd king, this great shepherd king, talks about I and me. Verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And so on. And the sheep are are stunned by this. This is the first surprise. They say in response, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And so forth. Their attitude, we see, is one of true humility and self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. Beautiful word. They look at their lives and they see nothing remarkable, nothing outstanding that makes them think they were serving the Lord Himself. What they did seems overblown. They're, They're minimizing the good that they've done in their lives. But the reply they receive in verse 40 is, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. In other words, Jesus tells his sheep that when we serve others, we are really serving him. Even if what they did was small. Even if what they did was seemingly insignificant. Giving a meal, giving water, making a visit, providing help in time of need, it was truly significant because it was done as if to Christ. But it's important to notice that these sheep, these followers of Christ, they don't actually serve others because they know they are serving Christ. But they're surprised by that. They're stunned. They're even shocked. That reveals the reason that they were serving others was not because they knew that they were being watched, being monitored. No, they are active, living selflessly in love for Christ because it was evidence of their love for Him and His love in them flowing out of them. So this text is teaching us that there is, in a sense, there is a sense in which every believer is Christ in disguise. That's truly something that is amazing to think about. There are no ordinary people. Think about how this truth will affect how you view others in the body of Christ your view of of the person sitting next to you or on the other side of the church building. Think of how this motivates us all to to operate within the communion of saints in which the Lord has placed us. This truth is, is truly revolutionary for the way that we think and the way that we live and how we treat each other in the church. But in contrast to the sheep, Christ describes the goats in completely opposite terms. Instead of welcoming them into his kingdom, he banishes them. Instead of saying, come, he says, depart. Instead of saying, you blessed, he says, you cursed. Instead of entering into eternal joy in the kingdom of the Father, they are sent to eternal joy fire. And the reason for this is because of the lack of evidence in their lives. They did not offer basic hospitality and care to others. They did not visit or 
feed or give water to the thirsty and, and so forth. They may have looked like disciples of Jesus, but, and they may have hung out with disciples of Jesus, but they may have been, they may have been, they may have borne the name of, of Jesus upon them, but they did not care for others. And we see that they are surprised as well. This is the second surprise. They're surprised when they discover that in their failure to give evidence of their faith, they failed to serve Christ. They say in verse 44, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? But Christ responds to them in verse 45, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the least one of these, you did not do it to me. Ultimately, their sin was a sin of omission. It was a failure in what they did not do. But though they express surprise, they do not show any humility. Unlike the sheep, they do not minimize their lives. They, they maximize their lives. They have pride and, and arrogance in their accomplishments. They're saying, in other words, what did we fail to do? What did we miss? They look back and, and they think that they've missed nothing. No omissions. No failures. But they're blind to see the reality. Christ replies, what you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Now what does this mean for us? Well, it obviously means everything. For the Bible repeatedly tells us that we will have to give an account. We will have to stand before that glorious judgment seat of Christ. And this passage is not only meant to make us aware that judgment is real, something that's going to happen, but that when Christ returns to judge, there will be need for evidence. After all, on the surface, there appears to be little difference between the sheep and the goats. They weren't so easy to tell apart, so the commentaries tell us. The sheep were not always these pure white animals as we understand them to be today, but, but they were sometimes brown, gray, sometimes had patches of black, and so they, they looked rather similar to the goats. It wasn't until the goats formed horns on their heads and, and showed more aggression than the sheep than, that then you could tell more clearly who were the sheep and who were the goats? In other words, evidence was necessary for this division. And so it is for, for the true disciples of Jesus Christ. We may profess the same faith. We may come to the same church building and the same worship services and be engaged in all the same activities. But the thing that the king will look for on the day that he comes to separate the sheep and the goats is evidence of our profession in practice. What that means for us personally on the day of judgment when the king asks us why he should let us into heaven, we will of course point to the wounds of our Savior and, and say, he bore those wounds for me. But then he will say, then what evidence do you have that that was the case in your life? How did you live? Then we will have to produce the evidence. So the warning of our text is, beware of having an empty profession, outwardly looking like sheep, outwardly looking like a professing believer, outwardly looking like a Christian is not enough. The same was true for Israel in the days of Isaiah. Perhaps the most striking words in that whole chapter we read from in Isaiah 58 were the two small words found in the middle of verse 2, as if. 
The Lord's complaint to his people at that time was, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Those words, as if, indicate that God's people can develop a kind of piety where on the outside we might look very spiritual, might look very religious, very righteous, very godly, but on the inside not be quite so clean or so fresh or so spiritual. And so there is that divide, there's that disconnect between the outside and the inside. Israel's piety was compromised by the fact that it was that it was accomplished uh, that it was accompanied by all kinds of of covenant breaking disobedience and violence and we we read about verbal violence physical violence financial violence economic violence quarrels and fights what this revealed was that there was a disconnect between sunday and monday Or to put it in different terms, a disconnect between mouth and hand, between walk and talk. We need to look into the same mirror, brothers and sisters, as which God held up to Israel. Our passage prompts us to ask, if we think about it deeply, how the world's dissatisfaction and the world's disbelief is due to the church's false piety. The gap between Sunday and Monday on the part of God's people. Of course, the appeal of the gospel suffers greatly due to the church's unfaithfulness when it acts unfaithfully. Not to mention the church's vitality and and vigor and and life is, is sapped by this disconnect. And so we can pose the question for ourselves to think about today and into the coming days. To what extent has the church lost credibility in society because of the disconnect between what we say and what we do? We hear the the warning of our passage, but what encouragement does it offer? Well, it's this. When we serve others in the name of Jesus Christ, we are actually serving Christ in them. The sheep described in this chapter, they didn't know this, didn't realize this, but we do. We do. This truth revealed in our text has the power to transform us in in radical and revolutionary ways. To understand that when we serve and love our Master, then we will love and serve the Master as we see Him in one another. Or to say it another way, when we serve one another, we are serving the King. How that changes the way we think and the way we live. Suddenly, it's not drudgery to serve others. It's not a burden to serve It's not about having others notice or recognize or applaud. It's done instead from a heart that's filled and and overflowing with Christ's love, giving away as much of it as we have to give. If only we had eyes to see one another in the way that Christ does. That's the encouragement of our text. And this is all amplified in light of eternity For Christ is teaching us that right now counts forever. And no moment we have should be wasted. For each moment and every encounter we have with each other carries this this weight of eternity. And so may our lives then give evidence of this kind of Christian piety true piety, so that we may hear our Savior say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me in prison, and you came to me. Amen. Our congregational prayer this morning, a few things we will remember. Uh, Brother John Waymacamp had to deal with some health difficulties and challenges in recent days, including some hospital visits and tests uh, due to having a blood clot, blood clot in the lungs. So we'll pray for him and for the treatment he receives for this. We'll also, we also have a number of occasions for which to give thanks. We give thanks that a newborn daughter was born to brother and sister Travis and Bonnie Peters, and they've named Nora Iris, whom we will see at the baptismal font this afternoon. We'll also, also today, Sister Ali Van Delden may celebrate a birthday, and tomorrow, Lord willing, is brother George Waymacamp's birthday. And finally, we will give thanks that tomorrow marks 40 years in the ministry for our Minister Emeritus, Reverend Tigalar, so we will give thanks for that milestone in their lives. Let us, with these matters in mind, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, having heard your word this morning, that your throne is a place of judgment, a place where you will judge through Christ one day the world, the whole world, the living and the dead. And yet, Lord, we know from your word that your throne is also a throne of grace. Lord, we confess that we all fall short in many ways of our calling to live as your people in this world, to live as the sheep, the righteous. We pray for your grace to be upon us that each of us here may be found ready and able to give evidence of the faith that you've worked in our hearts and that we do your will and show love and mercy to all whom you have placed on our lives path just as just as you have shown your undeserved love for us in Christ so help us to show similar love to our brothers and sisters. Lord, help us to live today and every day in view of eternity. 
Lord, the devil wants to convince us that there is no black and white, there is no division or separation, no judgment that will come, but your word clearly reveals this to be true. And so we pray that you will give us the eyes of faith to seek your favor in Christ and to demonstrate that we do indeed know you and are known by you by living in service to you and to one another, showing obedience and with the right motives of our hearts. Father, we remember before you all in, all in this congregation who are suffering, whether their circumstances are known or unknown. Father, be with Brother John Waymacamp. Lord, we thank you for watching over him in the past week and providing him with the medical care that he stood in need of. And we pray that you will also watch over him in these coming days as he receives further medical attention. Lord, we thank you that ultimately our trust is not placed in doctors or in the medical system, but that it is you who we can turn to and know that good health and also restored health, and even if it be your will, the loss of these things all comes from your fatherly hand. And so we ask you, Lord, to give whatever accords with your will. Lord, we thank you for the blessing that the Peter's family could receive from your hand, the gift of new life, a newborn baby daughter this week. We thank you for making all things well with mother and with child. And we look forward to witnessing the covenant sign and seal of baptism administered to this, your covenant child, this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for granting to our sisters, uh, Sister Allie Van Dalden, another birthday today and for the upcoming birthday of our brother George Waymacamp tomorrow. Lord, enable them both to rejoice and celebrate your faithful care and love for them through the past year and throughout their lives and cause them both to rely upon your grace and blessing in all that awaits them in the coming year. Lord, we thank you for the occasion that you've granted to our minister, Emeritus, Reverend Tigelar, that he may celebrate this week 40 years of ministry. Lord, we thank you for supplying the strength that you've given him to serve throughout his ministry and to continue to serve still in various ways in his retirement. Lord, to you we owe the honor and the glory and the praise. And so we give thanks to you. Lord, receive our thanksgiving, your blessings and gifts we've received from you. Also use our offerings we bring now for the purpose of advancing your kingdom in this world, especially as it serves those involved in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ in Asia. Lord, we pray that you will bless and equip the, min the missionaries who go there and who do this work and Give them the strength and enable them to gather your harvest in. Lord, we pray that you will be with us further yet this day and give us a good day of rest and worship and also of fellowship. So hear our prayer, for we ask it in Christ's name alone. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to worship Him through the offering of your gifts and your thanksgiving offerings. And after the offerings have been collected, let us sing our closing song from hymn 76, all the stanzas.
Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.